Today is October 1st, 2010, and I am interviewing Mike Campbell. Mr. Campbell is 63 years old. He was born on September 29th, 1947. My name is Mercedes Hiley. My name is Maya Siders, and we'll be the interviewers. Could you state for the recording what what war and branch of service you served in? I was in the United States Army, and I served during the Vietnam conflict. What rank? What was your rank? I was a specialist five, or E five. Where did you serve? I served in Vietnam and then Germany. How many years were you in the service? I was in the service three years because I volunteered. At that time, there was a draft, and during the draft, uh, you, was, you had to serve two years if you were drafted. Or you could join the Army for three years or four years, the Marines for four years, the Navy for four years, or the Air Force. I chose to join the Army, so I was called RA, Regular Army. If a person was drafted, they were U.S. So you served in the Army. Were you, where were you living at the time? Um, I was born and grew up in Wabash, and at that time I was still living in Wabash. How did you happen to serve in this war? In 1966, um, they had a draft, and so when you hit a certain age, uh, you would receive a letter that said, Greetings from your friends and neighbors. You have been chosen to serve. Uh, at By joining the Army, you could choose what types of schooling you would want to you wanted to go to and if you qualified when you took your test you could go to those schools otherwise you was assigned a school such such as infantry artillery armor what were you doing before you were drafted or enlisted uh, I worked for a company called Danners it was a variety store a you know, retail like a, a small uh, Kmart or Walmart Did anyone else in your family serve in the military? I had a brother. My little brother joined the Marine Corps when he got out of high school. And then from the Marines, uh, he went on uh, to spend another 20, 22 years in the Army. Can you tell Okay, tell my me? dad. My dad also served in the Army during World War II. Can you tell me about adapting to military life? Physical, physical regiments, brackets, food, social life. Oh, okay. Um, when you're when you're taken and in, inducted into the army, uh, the first thing they do is to make all people equal, no matter what. So everybody's hair was the same. That was no hair. Uh, your uniforms were all the same. OD green, your boots were all black, so everybody, everybody dressed the same, everybody ate the same food, everybody went to bed at the same time, everybody got up at the same time, uh, everybody made their beds at the same time, so everything was done at the same time. Everybody had to become uh, one unit. It taught me a lot of discipline. Uh, everything is based on discipline. You know, what time you went to bed, what time you got up, what time you ate. And one of the biggest things uh, they taught was be on time. No matter what you did, uh, it seemed in the military that they had you there 10, 15 minutes early and then you would wait. Uh, it was a hurry up and wait. How did you choose the branch of service you served in? I would say it's because my dad was in the Army. What kind of 
of training did you have? Well, we, you start out when you go into service with a basic training. That's where they teach you military courtesy, uh, military law, how to march, how to salute. They teach you about uh, your weapons. They also teach you first aid, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, and uh, things like that. From then, after you pass that course, uh, you go on to AIT or advanced individual training. Because I was in, had chosen ordnance, they sent me to Fort Lee, Virginia uh, to learn supply. And then after my first eight weeks of AIT, they sent me to another eight weeks of AIT to learn computers. Was there any friendships formed? There was a lot of friendships formed um, during that time because you don't have your friends back home anymore. So you have to make new friends uh, no matter where you go. Actions or duties away from the front line? Okay, after, actually there was no front and back lines in Vietnam. There was uh, combat units and non-combat units. Uh, I was in a non-combat support unit. Uh, what we would do is uh, we, we would transport by helicopters all of the people that was in. And when I went to Vietnam, we started out, we landed at Benoit, which was just outside of Saigon. And then from there, uh, I went to Nha Trang, which is on, on the coast north of uh, Saigon. Uh, at that point, we supported the 5th Special Forces. Then they moved us on up the coast to a place called Tuiwa. Tuiwa, we supported the 173rd Airborne, and from then, then they moved us all the way up the coast to Da Nang. Now, one interesting thing, when we moved from Nha Trang to Tuiwa, we used trucks and helicopters. On the move from Tuiwa to Da Nang, they put us on LSTs. And an LST is a big flat bottom boat that the front would drop down on. And that's how they moved all of our equipment, other than the helicopters. They moved, we had our supplies, um, the cooks had their kitchens, all of that had to be moved. So when you move an army unit from one point to another point, you, you not only have to move your kitchen, the people, you know, every piece of equipment that it takes. Uh, okay. How did you stay in touch with those back home? We stayed in touch by mail. We would write letters. And in Vietnam, your letters, if you mailed a letter from Vietnam, you could mail it for free. If you, um, your parents and friends would send you a letter, and usually it was by air mail, and it would cost them 10 cents. You know, at that time, we didn't have email. We didn't have little computers like uh, we have today. A computer back then would be all bigger than this table and could, not, could do less than what our laptops would do. What did you do for recreation? We played a lot of volleyball. And since we was usually on the coast, uh, we could we could swim. History of Vietnam. The history of Vietnam. Well, the history of Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam started out as an imperial country, which meant that it had kings, and, you know, queens type, and they the imperial capital would have been in Hue, which is almost up to the DMZ. That was the imperial capital. Then in the late 40s, uh, the communists took over and you had North Vietnam, which would have Ho Chi Minh, or I'm sorry, um, Hanoi, and then South Vietnam had Saigon for their capitals. 
after the fall of Saigon so, um, in the south by, um, in 1974, uh, it became one communist country and Saigon was renamed Ho Chi Minh City. Off-duty activities. Uh, we worked uh, pretty much 12 hours a day. We had two shifts in the unit I was in. So you would work either 6 in the morning to 6 at night or 6 in the night to 6 in the morning. In the meantime, uh, you could read. Um, couldn't go a lot of places. You know, you couldn't travel, you know, leave your unit very far. You could go to uh, the PX which was in the same compound and that would be your post exchange and that was just like a, a variety store like a small Kmart Were you still overseas when the war ended? I was out of the army then I, I served 1966 to 1969 What were the computers like? The computers? Well it was basically the size of this table and it would take two um, 40 foot semi trailers to house them because you had to take your own power supply uh, you had to take filing systems your desk um, they were really really slow now to input information into them today we just type on a keyboard you just keyboard back then you had to use what was called a key punch machine and you would have a cardboard card uh, about eight inches long and three inches uh, tall and this machine as you typed would punch holes in these cards in different places so that's how after you had all your information typed in each each item you you did would take one card so you would have to run all these stacks of cards through a card reader and then that would input it into the computer Did I ever get to see the buildings, buildings around the country? We saw a lot. Uh, Vietnam is a Buddhist co country. That's their main religion, and they had a lot of really neat-looking Buddhist temples. They'd have big statues of uh, uh, their Buddhist, like our churches have statues of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Well, they had uh, statues of Buddha. And Buddha had always seemed to have a big belly. Now, one other thing is the weather. Vietnam had really strange weather. In the summertime, um, it would be hot and muggy, depending on where you were along the coast uh, it could actually be cold up in the mountains you had m coastal areas you had um, rice paddies which we would call swamps here in the United States and that was a lot of that was in the southern part or the Mekong Delta then in the northern part or the central part uh, you had mountains which would be really really cold you had seasons, you had a summer season, and then you had a monsoon season. And instead of winter time, you had snow. We had rain almost every day. And many days, the weather, I, I would think, got down in the 40s. So it was really cold and wet in their winter time. They also, instead of having hurricanes, they had typhoons. And uh, we, we was caught one time in a typhoon along the coast and that was not a lot of fun you know they had big winds uh, we lost several of our our buildings and we had a lot of flooding but being a lot being in the sand it went down really really fast did you ever get to buy things buy things for like antiques and stuff to remember that place or like clothes or um we did not 
well yes we did I bought some cameras um, we bought souvenirs to send home uh, one of the things that um, a lot of um, GIs sent home was like these cloth maps that would show you know different areas that we was we was at um, you would also do the same um, when you went to Europe when I was in Germany um, we sent maps tablecloths and things like that home where did you want to go where did I want to go um, I did not want to go to Vietnam but they sent me so um, you know we made the best of it um, from Vietnam I didn't want to come back to the States I wanted to uh, see the rest see as much of the country or the world as I could so I volunteered to go to Germany and they uh, sent me there in Germany I was stationed in a in a town called Permisens it was in the western area of Germany almost on the French border what was your favorite Vietnamese food favorite Vietnamese food um, it had to be some of their um, breaded fried fish they they come in little bitty balls and they would uh, fry them in a wok and in Germany favorite food was schnitzel schnitzel and schnitzel is a veal cutlet made in breaded and fixed like a tenderloin and they're really, really good. You could get them breaded, or you could get them in a mushroom sauce, which was called Jaeger schnitzel. The other thing was, in Germany, was their hot potato salad. What's veal? Veal. Veal is a calf uh, that is just raised on milk. It's not grain-fed. They didn't have a lot of room over there to graze cattle, so they just um, fed them. Um, milk and raised them that way. What was it like to say bye to your army friends? It was kind of hard, uh, but you know, uh, when when they left or when you left, uh, you knew they was going to make new friends, and you knew you was going to make new friends. So it was just part of life at that back then. Holidays, um, they actually, the military made sure that you had really, really good meals. Even in Vietnam, we had uh, turkey with cornbread dressing, uh, cranberries. We had pecan pies. Uh, we had fresh milk. We had coffee, uh, tea. Uh, in Germany, uh, everybody would... Uh, including the officers and their wives would go to the mess hall which is like your cafeteria and they had a f had complete turkey dinners everybody wore dress uniforms or class a uniforms which would be um you know with shirts ties and it was a a pretty big deal then did you ever have parties did we ever have parties yes we did um in vietnam um once every other month, uh, the mess sergeant would have a cookout, and occasionally um, people would get um, goodie boxes from home for their birthdays, and they would share cupcakes and things like that that people back from um, their homes would send to us. So they would celebrate by sharing everything. Did you ever travel on a troop ship? We moved, when we moved from uh, Tuiwa to Da Nang, we traveled on LSTs, and those um, are like floating bathtubs. And um, the, the bad thing, if you could get them to rock side by side, if everybody would walk from one side of the boat to the other, you could actually rock, rock the ship. It was uh, crewed by Koreans which were our allies at the t in uh, Vietnam. Did you get support from the Navy, Air Force, Marines, or Coast, Coast Guard? 
Okay, um, yes we did. The Air Force, everything that the Army had, all of their supplies either had to come by air or by ship. So if we needed parts, when we needed parts from um, the U.S., they either had to be put on Navy ships or they had to be put on Air Force aircraft. Now a lot of the small parts um, were, that we needed really, really fast would be flown over by the Air Force. And the uh, large, large, big parts like engines and transmissions for helicopters, they would be brought over by ships. And so there was a constant supply. That's why we were normally very close to ports and always uh, close to um, an Air Force base. Now, one thing about the Air Force. Um, Okay, the Air Force um, always had movie theaters, and so uh, a lot of times we would go to uh, the air base, which would be three or four miles away, and watch movies. Did you have to go to a school for special training? Uh, yes, we did. Um, that would be your AIT, your advanced in individual training, and then your secondary schools, which I went to a computer school. Now, during the Vietnam War, uh, they had a large call-up of people. So the schools, the advanced schools, uh, ran 24 hours a day, five days a week. You would either go to school from eight in the morning to four at night, or four in the evening to midnight, or midnight uh, to 8 in the morning. My first school was midnight to 8. The second one was 8 to 4. So it was just like working third shift for 8 weeks and then uh, qualifying for the second school. And um, then you we worked days. Was there any type of internet? It, was there any type of internet? No, there was no internet. We had snail mail. Yeah, that's what you call writing writing letters and putting them in a stamp on them and mailing them. Um, that's that's how uh, that worked. But we did have telephone exchanges in the United States on all the bases. They had a telephone exchange, and that was like a big building that had 50 or 60 telephone booths in it, and you could go place your calls uh, back back home there. In Vietnam, if you wanted to call home, you went to a Mars station, and that was like a shortwave uh, radio or ham operators. And when you called home, if you said, hi, Mom, how are you? You had to say, over. And then they would say, we are fine. And before they, uh, they would break their conversation, they had to say, over. So that would tell the two different radio operators what time or when to switch from receiving to to sending. How did you know when to, just, to salute someone? How did you know when to salute somebody? Okay, officers uh, in Vietnam did not like to be saluted, so we did not salute those. Um, we learned in basic training when and where to salute. You did not salute inside a building unless you was reporting for duty. Uh, you would stand at attention when an officer uh, walked in the room. Officers wore insignia on their shirt collars and on their hats, uh, telling you um, what what rank they were. Enlisted men, that would be your private through your sergeant majors, always wore their insignias on their on their sleeves. You don't want to see my belly, do you? You would stand, your heels would be together, your chest would be up, your stomach would be sucked in, your face would be straight, your shoulders square, your hands down to your side with your hands, thumb pointing down, fingers curled up. Your thumbs would go right down the seam of your pants. 
and you would always look straight ahead. You would never look to the side. No matter if somebody to the side of you was talking, you would, you would always look straight ahead. You would never look at them because they was inspecting you for some reason, seeing if you had missed a, a whisker or, or your hair was properly cut. And all, the, all this time, they would be standing there asking you questions, which um, you was uh, required to answer. Do you still get paid after you get out? No. Once, once uh, you finish serving, uh, your pay ended. So I was only paid for three years. You know, once a month. When I went into the Army, I made $84.14 a month. And out of that, you had to buy all of your supplies, like your shaving cream, your shoe polish, tooth toothpaste, uh, deodorant. Uh, if you ever got a chance to have snacks during basic training, you had to buy those. Um, occasionally, they would let you go to a movie, so you had to pay your way in there, and that all come out of your $84. Okay, our uniforms back then were called fatigues, and they were OD green. Um, you had your name on it. You had your uh, branch of service, which would have been U.S. Army. You would have an American flag on one shoulder, and then um, you had your um, unit patches, which would be... Um, Ours, um, and then you had your um, campaign uh, shoulder patch, along with your rank on your sleeves, or if you was an officer, you had them on your sh on your epaulets. Organization of army. Pardon? Oh, the organization of the army. Okay, you started out in a platoon, which would be oh or actually a squad, which would be 12 people, 12, 13 people. And then you had four squads to make up a platoon. Then you had five platoons that would make up a company. And you usually had four or five companies that made up a battalion. Now, if you was that was if you were in the infantry. If you was in um, a support group, um, like I was in Vietnam, uh, they were called groups and not battalions. In Germany, it was the same thing. It was, I was in the 59th Ordnance Group, or OSCOM. Um, you're a vol vol our volunteer army today. If there was a need to be, um, I would volunteer to go back to the army. Um, I had no choice. I was going to either be drafted or join um, in 1966, so I chose to join to do uh, to get schooling uh, that I wanted. Uh, today, uh, when you volunteer, uh, you also get a volunteer and try to get the schools uh, that you want. And it's very, very technical now today. How did you return home? Uh, we flew home from. Uh, Cameron Bay to Seattle or SeaTac uh, on Flying Tiger Airlines. Flying Tiger Airlines was owned at that time uh, by a group of the original World War II uh, Flying Tigers. And they flew us from Vietnam to Guam and then across Alaska to Seattle. And then from Seattle uh, they give us new uniforms give us two new uniforms and airplane tickets uh, to the airport closest to our home. So we would fly, I flew from Seattle to Chicago to Fort Wayne. And then my parents picked me up there. And then f to go to Germany, I flew from Fort Wayne to New York, uh, went down to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey to be processed. And they put us on, took us back to New York, put us on planes, flew us to Shannon, Ireland, and then to um, Frankfurt, Germany. And in Germany, uh, they put us on trains to take us 
uh, to where our units were. Reception by a family or a community? Uh, when we come back from Vietnam, um, a lot of people didn't like us. There was big, a lot of protest against the war in Vietnam, uh, and they seemed to think that it was our fault, uh, the people that served over there. The older people, our parents and uh, people that served in Korea in uh, World War II uh, were very accepting. They, they understood what we was going through. But the younger people uh, did not uh, want to accept us. In fact, uh, sometimes they could get really um, mean to you, you know, verbally mean to you and do, do things that was not nice. How hard was it? to return to civilization life? For me, it was not very hard because um, I had gone to Germany, and in, in Germany, it, we worked um, 7.30 to 4.30 every day, five days a week. We had usually had weekends off except um, one weekend every other month. Um, one uh, day a month, you had to work a 24-hour shift, be on call from to take care of problems uh, that might come up during the night. So uh, it was just like working a, a civilian job. Um, when we left work, our jobs um, in the daytime, we could put on our civilian clothes. We could, uh, we could go into town, which was walking distance. Um, on weekends, we could go to other towns. So it was just pretty much like it is, is today. So it was only... Um, getting used to living back in the United States and having learning how to drive on our roads versus the roads in, uh, in Germany because they didn't have speed limits on their highways. Are you a member on any veterans organizations? No, I'm not. Any contact with fellow veterans? Uh, some. Um, we talk, but we don't talk about the war. We just talk about, oh, how things were back then. Um, and how things have improved today. Back then, um, our food come out of a can, for the most part. They were called C rations. Uh, today, they're called MREs, and you probably have seen uh, these in stores, the freeze-dried foods, uh, pretty much the same. Uh, only problem ever had with food was ham and lima beans. We had those for 11 days three meals a day, uh, so therefore Mrs. Campbell knows better than have lima beans in our house. That's the only food that I had never made my children eat was a lima bean. But we had we had a meal. Regardless of what it was, they, it was always a meal. Um, interest, another thing, um, we always used to carry our can openers one of our can openers on our dog tag chain. So you always had a can opener with with you, and it always had some lady's name on it, like Kay or Jean, uh, in the year that they were made. How has being in the military affected your life? It has taught me discipline. Um, it teaches you how to work and cooperate with other people. That, you know, life is just not always your way. It's, it's two-way street. You have to give, you have to take. Sometimes you have to lead, other times you have to follow. Uh, just depending on the situation, it teaches you to evaluate those situations and to act on them. Lessons learned? Lessons learned. Um, one of the biggest lessons is to cooperate with your fellow, fellow man. You know, respect them. You know, as they respect you, you know, you have to respect. Otherwise, uh, things does, do not work. Is there anything we forgot to ask you or you want to share? Um, I think we're doing pretty good here. Um, I appreciate being interviewed. And um, you, you ladies did a really, really nice job. Thank you. Thank you for doing the interview with us. Okay.